you. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about work I have been, I have done with Tanasis, uh, Larissa, and uh, Thomas. So uh, topological field theories uh, show up in various various situations. So for example, uh, topological strings, we have a, a and B models that are very well known, we have Chern Simons theory, they also show up in quantum matter uh, as emergent field theories. Uh, especially interesting uh, for this talk uh, is an H twisted Poisson sigma model and Dirac sigma model. So basically, the, uh, they show up a lot, and the point is to investigate. Uh, Certain some properties, uh, some properties of topological field theories. Uh, one thing that I'm going to focus on is uh, the BV. So looking for the BV, uh, the classical BV action for certain models, specifically Dirac sigma model, is of uh, special interest here. Uh, so when uh, so when we combine topological field theories and BV. Uh, one thing that we usually think of is the AKSZ construction. So it, it is a nice geometrical, uh, geometrical uh, procedure that allows us to construct uh, BV action for different, different theories. However, uh, the AKSZ construction requires uh, the QP structure on the target space. And while a lot of uh, top, a lot of field theories do have this property. So uh, an example is the Poisson Sigma model. Uh, there are uh, also those that do not. Uh, there are various reasons why uh, this might happen. So one option is that the P structure on the target is not available. The other option is that the P structure exists, but it is not compatible with the Q structure. So uh, an example of the second one is the H-twisted Poisson Sigma model. And the BV action for that uh, was found a few years ago by Noriaki and Thomas. Uh, so here, I'm going to talk about a more general theory, a Dirac Sigma model that can be viewed as a certain generalization of the Poisson Sigma model. Also, a few days ago, Tanasis talked about our Poisson uh, Sigma model. Uh, which is a different kind of generalization, but also encounters similar obstructions into constructing the BV. Uh, so in, the, in that case, we had a situation uh, that the P structure existed, but there, uh, the Q and P structures were incompatible because of the presence of the Vesumino term. The same thing happens in the Poisson uh, sigma model case. So the question that I'm, tr I'm going to try to answer here that I will answer here uh, is uh, what is a BV action, the classical BV action of the Dirac Sigma model. So first, uh, I'm going to introduce the Dirac Sigma model through the gauging of a two uh, dimension of a two dimensional Sigma model in general, where we have uh, a string model that propagates in the uh, target space M that is generally some D dimensional. Uh, in, uh, that has background fields of the metric G and the Vesumino term H. Uh, so here we have the maps X from the world sheet sigma two to the target space M and uh, sigma, two, uh, sigma three is a world volume that has sigma two as a boundary as is the standard for the Vesumino term. So uh, what, I'm, uh, what we are interested in here is the gauging of, uh, of this model. So the, the more traditional way one would perform some gauging is we would identify some symmetry group and then uh, promote the symmetries of the action to local symmetries, introduce gauge fields, and so on. Now, if we do have this gauge group G, Let's think a, a bit more in a geometrical way. Yes? Sorry? Yes. Uh, 
so in the more geometrical terms, the group G uh, kind of creates an equivalence relation on the target space, or in more geometrical term, it creates a foliation. Now, what we are going to do here is we are going to think a bit of in reverse. We are not going to take the gauge group, but we are going to take a foliation and then see whether we can gauge this action along this foliation. Uh, so, uh, since the only thing we do have is this foliation, we need to kind of find a way so we need to uh, put up some additional mathematical structures that will allow us to deal with this kind of thing. So in a similar way that we have been dealing with, uh, with usual group symmetries, where we uh, gauge using the Lie algebra of the group, here we are going to construct a Lie algebra over the target space. So we will have some Lie algebra E over M with anchor row and some Lie and some Lie brackets. Now, taking the uh, local basis of sections on this Lie algebra, and we can define the corresponding structure function C here. Uh, the anchor map is a homomorphism by the definition of a Lie algebra. Uh, so, uh, the so the projections of these local sections denoted by row A will satisfy the same kind of algebra. Now, uh, this Lie algebra is then taken in such a way that these vector fields rho, rho A uh, generate the foliation that we want to describe. So th that is the basic idea. So, uh, so what we do here is we take the foliation and then we find the Lie algebra such that the pro projecting, projected vector fields generate the foliation. Okay, now, uh, what we want to do is, the, uh, remembering back, so this foliation, so the orbits of this foliation, uh, represent the, uh, the same kind of physical states of, of our theory. So the gauge transformations for, uh, for the fields X that we have in the original action uh, need to take uh, this kind of form. So they are the transformation along this, uh, these orbits. And epsilon here is an arbitrary section of the Lie algebra. So the next step is then in to introduce the gauge fields. So these are uh, one formed on the world sheet and they, do, and they take values in our Lie algebra. And then we take the most general possibility for the gauge action. So we take the original action that had this metric term and the Vesomino term, and then basically add up whatever we can inside. So all the combination of dx and a. <coughs> we make a similar ansatz for the gauge transformation of a. So delta a has the form of r times d epsilon, S times Hodge D epsilon plus all other terms that we can add. I'm not going to list all of those because there are quite a few. They are not important uh, he, that much really, but uh, these two terms are interesting. So one thing that we do need is uh, to be able to construct the covariant field strength of X if we want to have a diffeomorphism invariance. And it turns out that in order for this to uh, be possible, uh, the R plus minus, which are these R plus minus sets that come from this gauge transformation, need to be in vertical when you think of them as matrices or operators, whichever way you, you like to think. Uh, it is, uh, if they are not invertible, then uh, they're, they're, uh, the covariant field strength is just impossible to construct. So diffeomorphism invariance fails. <coughs> the next step then, so from now on, I'm assuming they are invertible. So the next step then is to find uh, the compatibility conditions and constraints on all of this gauging data. So we take the gauge transformations that I have written so for X and for A, 
plug them into the action and see under, uh, what conditions have to be satisfied in order for the action to be gauge invariant. Uh, and we get a bunch of equations that I have not listed here. <coughs> uh, but what is uh, interesting is that there are some redundancies in this uh, description. One thing that we can do is make a redefinition of the gauge fields of this form. So if A uh, be becomes some new field of the form alpha A plus alpha twiddle uh, Hodge of A, then it is possible to kind of simplify both the gauge transformation of the gauge fields and the action. And the necessary condition for this to be possible is actually for R plus minus to be invertible. So if alpha and alpha twiddle as alpha twiddle are taken as some functions of R plus minus inverse, so inverse of those matrices, the, it is possible to reduce uh, the gauge action to this form, so removing some of the terms. Uh, this, now, it might not, it might seem a bit, uh, like it's not possible, so one also has to use some of the uh, some of the gauging conditions on the data that I have mentioned before that we get from the uh, from requiring the gauge invariance, but the gauge transformation becomes this kind of thing. And what we can see is that the metric uh, that uh, the gauge fields couple minimally to the metric, since this f is just the covariant field strength of dx. Yes. Uh, here. Uh, yeah, I have not mentioned that uh, yet. So uh, theta is a one form, or one form on the target space, and gamma is a function on the target space. So theta a can be written in the form theta a i times d x i. Uh, omega is at this point some unknown function. So it's a function of x. Yeah, it's. It, uh, it turns out to be a connection. Hmm? Yes. Uh, so specifically, this kind of uh, this kind of action was done a few years ago. So this is not, this is not a new thing. The new uh, the new thing that I mentioned is the reducing the minimal uh, the non-minimal coupling to the metric to the minimal one. So it turns out that the non-minimal coupling to the metric is actually impossible. The only thing is that in the previous language, we just had some definition redundancies, which turned out to be quite interesting. So the gauge transformation then turned out to be uh, this, uh, have this form, where C are the structure functions that we had from before, and omega and phi at this point are just some functions of x. And then we look at the gauging constraints and conditions. So the first constraint that turns out is that gamma is completely determined by both rho and thetas. So gamma AB is yota rho A theta B. Uh, the, then we have two additional constraints. So what we can do is we uh, look at the combinations of rho and theta, so rho plus theta, and we can consider them as sections of the generalized tangent bundle T plus C star. Uh, the remaining uh, constraints can be then written in this form, where this is just a bilinear pairing on T plus C star, and this is the Quran bracket, uh, the H-twisted Quran bracket, uh, the standard one, on the generalized tangent bundle. And what it ba this means uh, is that uh, Rho plus theta must live on a sub-bundle of E of T plus T star uh, such that the bilinear pairing is zero and which is closed under this Quran bracket, making it a Dirac structure. And thus, and thus this is called the Dirac sigma model. So when all of this data, is, yes? Mm 
Mm-hmm. 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 Yes. Okay. Uh, I think the last, the last thing I said was uh, that raw plus theta live on a Dirac structure. <laughs> uh, now, uh, here I'm going to focus only on full Dirac structure, so the full rank. Uh, because in that case, we have a very nice thing, and uh, that theta plus minus rho, this rho star here just means that uh, rho, uh, using the metric G, uh, rho is put, uh, rho is transformed to uh, one form. So it is, G, uh, rho star is just G of rho. Uh, 
So in the case of the full Dirac structure, these combinations uh, turn out to be invertible maps, mm -hmm. which is uh, something that we will need uh, later on. Uh, okay. So uh, I have talked about constraints. Uh, so the uh, so what are the constraints between those different parameters that uh, we introduced here? But we also get uh, conditions on the background data. So these two conditions, in the same way as the constraints. Uh, and uh, what we are going to now look here is uh, what was already mentioned is what are these omega and phi. So if we consider a transformation, a a transformation of the local basis that we have been using uh, on the Lie algebra, and look at the transformation of this omega and phi, it turns out that omega transforms as a connection while phi transforms as a tensor. Uh, using, using that information, we can define uh, the connection on E uh, in this way with this omega as connection coefficients. But what is uh, much more uh, convenient is to actually define new, uh, two new connections uh, novel plus minus with, connect, uh, with connection coefficients omega plus minus that are just omega plus minus phi, since the sum of a connection and an endomorphism is again a connection. And then it is possible to take this background data, so uh, these conditions on the background data, so these two equations, and invert, invert them to obtain the uh, omega plus minus in terms of G and H. What this tells us is that there are actually no conditions on the background data, meaning that uh, no matter what G and H are, the gauging is always possible. We can always find this omega plus minus. And uh, also uh, another connection, this nabla circle shows up here, that is some torsionless uh, connection, an arbitrary torsionless connection. Okay, with these two uh, connections, novel plus minus, uh, on the target space, uh, we can define uh, new connections, nabla star plus minus, uh, on the cotangent bundle. So uh, using the, this curly G. So basically what we are transforming, so uh, Navalo plus minus act on our Lie algebra. So they are connection on the Lie algebra. And then we can use this G to go from the Lie algebra, which is a Dirac structure, to uh, the cotangent bundle and back. In a similar way, we can define it on the tangent bundle as well. So. Uh, it's uh, just a composition of a few functions. And the co uh, corresponding coefficients are of this form, with uh, gamma circle being the connection coefficients of Nava circle. And theta plus minus here is the torsion tensor uh, given, by, given in this way. So uh, it depends on the Vesumina term, on the H. We can also find the curvature of the novel plus minus connections in the standard uh, Cartan form. So R plus minus is D omega plus omega wedge omega. And there is a corresponding Bianchi identity uh, that connects uh, this R plus minus curvature and the uh, theta plus minus torsion. Okay. Now, it turns out that this curvature is not really very interesting, but there are some other things that is quite more useful when it comes to the BV. So one thing that, the first thing that we will need is the notion of E connection. So in general, uh, when we have a Lie algebra over some manifold and some arbitrary uh, vector bundle, this curly F over the same uh, base manifold, we can define an E connection uh, as, a bi uh, as a bilinear map of taking section of E and F and giving section of F. Hmm? 
Well, yeah, okay. Not respect to the functions. It, it, it is in the respect to addition, but in respect to functions multiplying, it's, it needs to satisfy these two properties. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, these are the two properties that we needed to satisfy. And we also have the corresponding E curvature defined in a completely standard way as one would usually define a curvature. And then uh, we can take a special case when this vector bundle F uh, is equal to the Lie algebra E and define an E torsion also in a pretty standard way. Now, going back to the situations that we have, so having the... Sorry? Yes. Yes, uh, so we need the Lie algebra structure, but this, uh, this I have, uh, cannot define without F being equal to E, so the torsion part. Uh, okay, so in the present case where we have two connections novel plus minus, we can define two E connections denoted by E novel plus minus uh, in this way. So basically we want the, the E connection of some section is, equ uh, is equal to the normal, okay, um, E derivative of E prime over E is uh, equivalent to the derivative of E prime over the projected E. So we use the anchor to project down. And of course, there are the corresponding E torsions for uh, these two connections uh, that turn out to be, uh, to have this form. Okay. Uh, now, uh, these uh, two connections that we have also induce two extra con connections uh, called basic connections uh, that are E connections, one on the Lie algebra E and one on the tangent bundle TM uh, in kind of this form. Uh, and so basically what we have is we have these two new connections uh, they are both called basic connections and I'm using the same, uh, same notation and I'm just going to uh, use uh, whichever one of these I need depending on what they are. Uh, and then these two, uh, these two connections are uh, related by the anchor map such that the composition of rho with the one is equivalent to the composition of the other connections with rho. And uh, finally, the thing that we really need that, ha that has the, main, uh, the real importance for the BV is the basic curvature, S plus minus, that is defined in this way. So this is not the regular definition of the curvature for these, uh, these connections, but it is related to them. So the first part uh, is, uh, is something that when projected, with rho would give a curvature of the basic connection. And then the last two parts are here in order to make this object a tensor. Uh, and in component form, when calculated for the special case we have, uh, we can express this S plus minus uh, in terms of torsion and uh, regular uh, curvature. Okay, uh, one other thing that is interesting, we can also express everything that we did in a target space covariant formulation and the way I have actually written most of stuff, it's very easy to do. The only non-trivial thing uh, is the, trans uh, the gauge transformation of a, a little less trivial than the other ones. So delta X was basically already uh, written in the covariant way. And then delta A can be expressed 
uh, in this in this way. So there are torsions, there are these two connections, and there are these two exterior derivatives that are induced by the Nabla plus minus connection. So everything is uh, properly covariant. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, which one? Uh, del ah, delta. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, sorry. So this this should be rho of epsilon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how is this? How is this under Young Mills? Well, yes, f is zero, but I do have these these two other terms. Yes. Yes. That's a separate issue. I, it, 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 it's, uh, so I agree with you that there, there is a possibility of that, uh, but that kind of thing is not included here. So, Yes, I guess it could be extended. I'm not. I'm not sure whether there there would be any major obstructions to that or not. So I cannot. Uh, yes.
Uh, okay, now one example that was just now mentioned is the twisted Poisson sigma model uh, that we obtained by uh, choosing the Lie algebra to be a cotangent bundle, uh, the anchor to be just the uh, Poisson bivector or more specifically twisted Poisson bivector that satisfies this condition, uh, theta to be dx, and then one extra condition, we uh, put G to zero in order to obtain the standard uh, twisted Poisson sigma model. So this is a nice example. Uh, also what I uh, want to mention, this G equals zero condition that I have put here is not necessary, but uh, we could have allowed G to be something and we would get a more complicated action, like an extra, we would have an extra metric term, and there would be a, uh, some extra terms in the transformation of A. In this special case when G equals zero, which is possible for the Poisson case, uh, the phi is equal to zero, and the two connection nabla phi plus minus just become the one connection nabla omega that, uh, that we had at the beginning. The corresponding uh, e-torsion of uh, this one connection is just nabla phi. Uh, they are dependent on G and H. So given uh, the metric and the reform H, you can, uh, there, they, they can be expressed in terms of those. So you can find omega plus minus for those specific G and H. Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, now, uh, as I already mentioned in the beginning, uh, when it comes to BV, the important thing is the QP structure uh, that we are interested in. So, uh, in general, uh, in these kind of situations, the Q structure, which is, uh, which is a cohomological vector field on a differential gate manifold can easily be found and it's given in this way uh, for some Lie algebra uh, E, where we have the zero degree coordinates X and one degree coordinates Ta. And this squares to zero uh, as long as E is Lie algebra. Then the P structure is a graded uh, symplectic structure, uh, omega. And now uh, in this case, uh, it it's questionable whether this can be found at all. Uh, one possible option is to take omega to have the form dx, which d a, this small a, where a is given in this form, so it has the components of theta in terms of x times uh, xi. Now, uh, this uh, form, it's a two form, it's closed, but in general, it is not non-degenerate, so it can be degenerate, and in this case, it is a pre-symplectic form. It, uh, become, uh, it is non-degenerate only when uh, theta is invertible. So only in those cases, like it is the case for the Poisson, uh, Poisson model, 
uh, does the peace structure genuinely exist? Now, even when it does exist, it is not enough uh, to have both Q and P structure in order to have the QP structure. We need, uh, for the QP structure, the symplectic form needs to be Q invariant as well, meaning that the lead derivative of omega along Q needs to vanish. Uh, specifically for the, uh, for the omega that we had, uh, this lead derivative uh, takes this form, so it depends on H. Uh, meaning that in the presence of the Vesumino term, uh, this compatibility condition is obstructed. So the presence of the QP structure is obstructed. Uh, That's preventing us from using the AKSZ method. Okay, now in order to, con uh, to find the BV action, uh, we cannot use the BRST, but we can use the kind of standard uh, brute force technique, let's call it. Uh, so the first thing that uh, we do, we take the field content, so X and A, we enlarge those uh, by introducing the ghost field C that correspond to the gauge parameters epsilon, we have ghost deg degree zero, and then uh, construct a BRST operator, which is basically uh, given by the gauge transformations, at least when acting on X and A. And then uh, when acting on C, uh, this, this uh, its action on the Cs is determined uh, by the requirement that the BRST operator needs to be nil positive on shell, meaning that it's proportional to the equations of motion. So in this specific case, S squared on X and S squared on C uh, vanishes identically. And <coughs> when acting on A, it has two terms, one proportional to F and one proportional to the Hodgeware. This S and S twiddle are given as the combination of S plus and S minus being the basic, uh, basic curvature that we had from before. Okay. Next. To get to the BV part, we also need to introduce anti-fields for every of the fields that we had. So we have doubled the number that we had before, introducing X dagger, A dagger, and C dagger. Uh, their ghost and form degrees are in this table. So X dagger and A dagger has ghost degree minus one, while C dagger has minus two. When, while when looking at form degrees, A dagger has form degree one, and X dagger and six dagger have form degrees two. Uh, one thing to note here that is pretty important is that all that there are no scalar anti-fields. Okay, and what we do then is in order to construct the action, we want to solve the classical master equation. So we, are, uh, we can expand the BV action in terms of the number of anti-fields, so that in this way, so that here S0 contain no anti-fields, S1 contains terms with one anti-field, S2 contains terms with two anti-fields. Then, and that's it in this case. So S3 here cannot exist because we don't have scalar anti-fields. So we cannot, uh, we cannot construct a two, uh, a two form with three anti-fields in this case. So we stop at S2. Uh, okay, S0 here, having no anti-fields, is just the classical action that we had before. S1, which is the sector with one anti-field, is determined by the BRST operator completely, uh, which happens in order to have the proper gauge invariance included in the BV, in the BV formalism, so it's given in this way. And then S2 has to be determined in order for the full action to satisfy the classical master equation, this one, where the brackets denote the usual anti brackets. And what we do is we decompose the classical master equation into uh, sections depending on the number of anti fields. So we have the first that S0 with S0 has to vanish, which is trivially true because S0 contains no anti fields. Uh, S0 with S1 vanishes identically, 
uh, because of the gauge invariance. And then we are left with uh, these three equations. So making an answers for S2 in this form, uh, so including basically all the pro possibilities that we can with Y and Z some unknown uh, functions at this point, uh, and plugging this into this uh, third equation, uh, we can, we, it is possible to find a solution. Uh, so here it is, uh, the solution is this, where it is written in terms of y plus minus, which is what y plus minus is. Then the next part is uh, to check the last two equations. So the last one is easy because it vanishes automatically. Uh, since there are no, uh, S2 does not contain any of the pair of field anti-field. So for example, it contains A dagger, but not A. And uh, then the only one left is S1 with S2. Uh, so this is not uh, trivial in the sense that the last one vanishes, so it has to be checked. And then after a bit of calculations, it turns out that it does vanish. And the final BV action takes this kind of form. I know it's long, it's, I, I don't expect it to read through it all. Uh, okay, so it's just the classical action, the gauge transformations, and the last part with all the coefficients here being the uh, bit written in terms of the basic curvatures, which is, the, uh, which is what I said before, why basic curvatures are important. As it turns out, uh, it, it seems that uh, of the uh, geometrical structures that we have in the theory, the basic curvature is what determines how the classical BV action will look like. Okay, and there is also an example uh, of the H twisted plus on sigma model. Uh, basically, it has similar form. So there, are the, uh, what shows up is this pro uh, product of two H's uh, that comes from the basic curvature. <sighs> okay. So, to conclude, uh, what, uh, what did we actually show here? So, first thing to note is, uh, well, that's actually the first, uh, first by the generalized gauging of the two-dimensional sigma model results in Dirac sigma model. Okay, that is not really a new result, but uh, it's good. I just presented it to have a nice summary. Then the next thing that is important is that there are topological field theories that do not have QP structure. Uh, so for those cases, for those kind of theories, it is not possible to use the AKZ construction to find the BV action. So, there, there we need to find another way to deal with those kind of situations. <coughs> and as we have shown, uh, this can be possible. Uh, in general, it should be possible, at least in principle, uh, to use this kind of te technique for any kind of action. It's pretty much a brute force technique, and then whether you will succeed or not, it just, it depends on how difficult the actual calculations are. Uh, now, what is important is the result, uh, which I have already mentioned, in the sense that uh, the, fin the final thing that showed up, so in specifically in S2, is that uh, the coefficients there are written in terms of the basic curvatures and of the curly G, uh, the curly G part, which are basically uh, sections on, sections uh, from the dire uh, direct structure. Specifically, what it means that all of the, all of the coefficients are written in geometric terms. So, one would expect that there should be some geometrical explanation of what is going on and how to actually construct such things. So one thing that would be very interesting to actually do, having kind of this, uh, this example and a few other examples that have been uh, found for 
the cases where AKSZ don't work, doesn't work, is to actually expand the AKSZ formalism to include target spaces, uh, to include situations where target spaces do not have the QP structure. So that would be very interesting. Also, uh, one, uh, two other things that can be done, uh, done for this specific case of the Dirac Sigma model is to actually do the quantization quantization here, uh, so finding the quantum master equation and so on. Uh, and the final thing is to look at what happens when, uh, with the BV action when uh, the metric is changed. Once uh, it is something that I have not mentioned before and that the capital F is uh, equation of motion for this thing and it does not depend on the metric G. So classically, uh, the met, uh, these, uh, these theories are equivalent for different metrics. So uh, it is not clear what ha uh, how this equivalence translates into the, B, uh, the, the BV action. So just changing, uh, it is not just, it is not uh, simple to see what happens. So it would be very interesting to see how what, what would actually happen? So how this classical equivalence would transform into the quantum equivalence? Okay, thank you.